coming up on Bronco Tales. When we do our yearly surveys, it's really interesting to see the differences in the data of each school community. And we survey on a wide array of things, um, such as school safety, having a trusted adult substance use, um, community factors, more individual factors as well. And it's really interesting to see how different each community is from each other. Hello, and welcome to Bronco Tales with the College of Health Sciences. My name is Haley Stewart, and I'm the Communication Specialist for the School of Public and Population Health. In this episode, we're focusing on the Communities for Youth organization and the Boise State students behind its success. Today, I'm joined by two of those students from the School of Public and Population Health, Caden Griffin and Livy Luovanos. Thank you so much for having us, Haley. Uh, my name is Kaden Griffin. I'm a current Master of Public, of Public Health student. I'm emphasizing in prevention and intervention programming, and I'm also getting my certificate in data-driven decision-making. Um, I am a current graduate research assistant for Communities for Youth, which is an organization utilizing upstream prevention methods and combining community strengths to foster positive youth we- well-being outcomes all across Idaho. Yeah, and uh, I'm also here. My name is Limna Ruevanos. Uh, I am also a prevention and intervention emphasis master's of public health student. I, unlike Aiden, I'm in my first year uh, and I'm also a research assistant with Communities for Youth. I'm very excited to be here. Great. Thanks guys for joining me. So to get us started, what is the Communities for Youth organization all about? I think at its core, it engages communities to build capacity within them to help them be the best they can be for young people. One of the things that they really like to focus on or that we really like to focus on is that it's not a prescriptive program. We don't go in and tell people what to do. We understand that each community is different. And so through the help of surveys, uh, we gather data and we have community meetings to share that data as well. And um, have the community lead in whatever they want to tackle. I don't know if you would you like to speak more to it? Yeah, no. Um, I think that one of the most wonderful things about our organization is that we're really based in the community setting instead of the individual setting. Um, when we go alongside, work alongside communities, I'm so sorry, this is so funny. Um, when we go into communities, um, we we don't just, like Libby said, we don't go in there um, and start telling them what we think that they should do. We, we do a very long iterative cycle, um, constantly changing, and we work alongside them. So we pr- um, present their data to them, their own actual data um, about their young people in their community and then we ask them where where they want to go from there so if they want to highlight some bright spots in their community or some potential areas of opportunity um, we will be right there alongside them throughout the process um, however they need but they're they're really in control and we're just there for for support yeah and our overall goal is to really support them and slowly uh, hand them more of the rails so that in the future they are, are able to do this work by themselves and yeah, basically drive drive by themselves. Great, great. Sounds like a great organization. So what prompted you to join Communities for Youth? Yeah, when I was an undergrad, I took research methods with Dr. Megan Smith, who's the director of Communities for Youth. Um, and when I applied for the public health master's program, one of my friends mentioned that Megan had a graduate assistant position open um, working alongside Communities for Youth. And I set up a meeting with her. She told me, what our organization was about, and I immediately became really interested and wanted to be a part of it um, because I've grown up in Boise, so the work we do in Idaho is really important to me, and um, mental health struggles are something that's close to my heart and those around me, and so I wanted to learn more about what communities could do to combat this big prevalent topic and more interested about working in a community setting. Um, And then I was also really interested in learning how to perform data analysis, which is something that um, Megan very much supported me in doing. And she um, helped me really understand how to do it. And it kind of sparked my my love for it even more. And what I also really appreciate is she'll gently push me to do more things and learn more skill sets so that I can have um, a broader array of them. Um, and 
I know that I'm never not supported. Everyone on our team is very, um, very supportive in whatever you want to take on. Yeah, so I did my undergrad here at Boise State, and it was a STEM major. It was um, biochemistry, and one of the main reasons why I was so apprehensive to go into grad school is because I felt like I was being kind of driven away from my community and more emphasized into laboratory work. So coming into my master's in public health, I really wanted something that would allow me to connect with community. Um, community engagement is one of my passions, so community use for youth, when the opportunity came up, it checked all the right boxes. And one of the main things that really drove me to it is the fact that they listen to communities. Um, sometimes it's really hard as an academic to go into communities because they feel like, oh, they're just going to come get my data and publish a paper. But with Communities for Youth, it wasn't about the prestige of a paper. It was truly about embracing the Idaho way of taking care of your neighbor. Um, and just truly saying, oh, we're here to help you. Great. So I think those that look up Communities for Youth's website or those that maybe go to the community meetings, um, they'll hear a lot or see a lot about um, upstream prevention model that you work with. Can you tell me a bit about that? Absolutely. So when we say upstream prevention, we're talking about moving upstream to, identi to identify risk and protective factors that lead to poor mental health outcomes in our youth, as opposed to purely relying on crisis intervention. Um, I always compare the concept of upstream prevention to a river. Um, I'm, I'm sure that we, um, those who have listened to this podcast before, have, have maybe heard a little bit about upstream prevention um, and comparing it to the Boise River. Um, so with this analogy, you can imagine that kids are falling into the river and they're needing immediate crisis help. And what do we typically do? We, we get them out of the river as fast as we can. Um, but what if instead of purely relying on crisis intervention to get these kids out of the river, we instead look upstream to see why they're falling in the river in the first place? Are they being pushed? Is there a bridge that's helping them get across the river? And by doing this, we can prevent kids from getting into the crisis in the first place. Um, we look at those risk and protective factors, so risk factors being those that harm or contribute to poor mental health outcomes. Um, and then, so for example, not having a supportive family, um, feeling isolated, having low feelings of mattering, those kind of things are all risk protective factors. Then we also looked at protective factors being those that protect and foster good mental health outcomes. So for example, having a trusted adult or having a sense of community and feeling um, a high sense of mattering, those are all protective factors. And when we identify those risk and protective factors in a community, we, lurk, we work alongside them to support how they choose to tackle those factors. Um, and the same goes for when we identify those really good protective factors in a community. We help them celebrate and maintain that. Yeah, and I think it's um, oftentimes when you ask a parent or someone in the community about mental health and youth well-being, they will immediately go to uh, crisis prevention, um, a mental health care provider. And what we're trying to do with upstream prevention is saying, yes, that is an option. However, let's see what other places we can also help. And it really does help bring in the community. One of the things we've been pushing is saying, oh, well, maybe you can have a game night and engage those protective factors of having a trusted adult in a child's life. Great, great, really trying to get ahead of potential issues instead yeah. of just working on the issues when yeah. they get there. Absolutely, and um, I might add a little bit more on what Libby was saying. Um, we like to say that the scope of the solution has to match the scope of the problem. And by saying this, um, so often when we ask communities what they need to better mental health outcomes, it's always identified that there's a shortage of mental health professionals, which is true in every county in Idaho, and they are so needed and valued, but it can't be the only solution because there is um, a shortage of those professionals. For something as large as the scope of mental health in our youth, the scope of the solution has to match it. And that's another reason why we prioritize identifying those risk and protective factors so that we can work alongside those communities and see what other solutions there are. Great. So I can imagine in these community meetings, you have to tackle some 
probably pretty tough conversations about mental health occasionally, maybe even all the time, uh, with people you may have never even interacted with before. I assume these are a lot of the time just people you just met. So what are the challenges that come with that? I think the main challenge is finding a way to truly honor that person's lived experience and what's um, causing them to share with this, share all of this with us. Um, and also continuing our work. Oftentimes when people hear about mental health struggles, they go to a negative perspective or a negative, um, what's it called? They have like a negative point of view on it, being like, oh, it's sad. And yeah, I've also struggled. And we want to validate those feelings, but also in our community meetings say like, oh, well, together we can come and solve this issue as as a community we can come together and yeah trying to validate their feelings but also keep track of the work we're needing to do absolutely although there are some tough conversations that we definitely do have um, and there are some individuals who may be hesitant about the work we do or how we conduct our work um, those ones those conversations are some of the most rewarding conversations, in my opinion. Um, in one of our community engagement classes, we did some modules on how to navigate ex exactly these diff difficult conversations with people who have differing opinions from you. And in the mental health space, we can all agree on one thing, and that's we want our youth to thrive. Um, we may have different opinions on how to get there, but we all have a shared end goal. Um, and those conversations with those opposing voices are so incredibly important and sometimes they can be tough to navigate, but those voices are absolutely needed at the table and we welcome them with open arms. Yeah, for sure. So I think when uh, people think about student research or co-curricular activities that students have in addition to their classes at Boise State, they'll probably think of lab research or maybe working by themselves. But the two of you are really engaging a lot with big community groups and out in different communities all the time. So what are some key things you've learned about engaging in that way and sort of that being your, your research, the way you do that? Hmm. I think the main thing I've learned is that each community is different, yet we all have the same end goal. So one of the big skills I think we've both learned is how to navigate different atmospheres within the different communities. And also that each community has its own bright spots and its places where there's more opportunity. Absolutely. That's exactly what I was going to say. Um, that's something that I didn't expect to see was how different each individual community is from each other. Um, even those that are locationally right next to each other, they could have completely different needs, um, areas of opportunities and bright spots. Um, when we when we do our yearly surveys, it's really interesting to see the differences in, in the data of each school community. Um, and we survey on a wide array of things, um, such as school safety, having a trusted adult, substance use, um, community factors, more individual factors as well. And it's really interesting to see how different each community is from each other. Um, and, yeah, and I, I think also is the same way someone that might be doing bench research sees what they're learning in their classes play out in their experiments. I think we also see that with our own classes. and. Um, the community work that we do. Yeah, I think our research is a little bit different from what you typically hear, as you mentioned, Haley, um, because we're in a community engagement setting. We're right there alongside the community instead of being in a lab um, or just doing data all day. We work alongside them, which is something that that I definitely didn't know of when, when I entered the program and mm -hmm. something that I absolutely want to continue to do. And definitely, sorry, but it definitely sets you up to deal with different challenges because it's less of a controlled environment. Uh, but it also, like, you create lifelong relationships and you do get closer with the communities that you work with, even if um, I grew up in the North End my whole life, but now that, we're, that I'm part of this work, I have a lot of connections to Marsing now. And it's something I would have never had if I hadn't done this type of research. Yeah, very cool. So how has working with Communities for Youth changed your outlook on public health's role in mental health? 
For me, there's two things that come to mind. And the first is that there's so much value in community efforts. Um, and that also goes back to having those tough conversations and needing those people at the table. We truly need every single viewpoint because it's the community and the community knows itself the best and all of their values and opinions are, are needed at the table and in the space that we work in. And the second thing that comes to mind is that mental health work seems like a daunting task to take on, um, but seeing the incredible work that our communities have been able to accomplish since um, Communities for Youth began has been an incredibly eye-opening experience. Sorry. In one of the communities that we work in, we saw that their moderate to severe depressive symptoms rates went from 66% of their students um, struggling with moderate to severe depressive symptoms to 24% of them in just two years. And that's a direct reflection of one, passionate communities um, can do incredible things together through engaging with each other and coming together for a common goal. And two, the task of improving mental health is, is one that can be changed and ca it can be improved. It seems like an uphill battle sometimes, but it is absolutely something that can be transformed. Yeah, I think mine is along the same lines, whereas before engaging with Communities for Youth and um, public health, you see the news cycle and you kind of get bombarded with all the negative things that are going on in your community and even in like our master's classes we get taught about all the negative things that are going on with our community but with communities for youth it truly is about what we can do how we can tackle all these things and how it's not that it's like mount everest it's giant tasks to do but it's not impossible great what has been the most rewarding part of your experience working with communities for youth so far getting to talk with our youth um, I really love performing all the quantitative data work on our surveys, but I've recently begun to love the, qu the qualitative work as well. A professor in one of my data classes once um, mentioned in one of our courses that qual quantitative work tells you that there's a story somewhere, but qualitative work tells you what that story is. And that's something that I've taken with me throughout this work. Um, and getting to talk directly with the youth about their own data is incredibly rewarding they're they're super insightful for being so young mm -hmm. and they know who they are and they're able to voice um, their thoughts and feelings so well i didn't think that i was capable of doing that when i was their age <laughs> and so every time I, I leave a folk a youth focus group i'm refilled with a lot of hope about this upcoming generation's well-being and i learn a lot from them yeah i think my most rewarding um experience with communities for youth is how we engage the entire community oftentimes with initiatives it's only p people in that community that have the capacity to attend meetings and be plugged into the work that people are doing however with communities for youth one of the main um, communities that we've been or part of the community that we've been kind of pursuing is the hispanic community and hearing them give us feedback about how they feel very engaged and how they appreciate all the effort we go to to make sure that things are in their language and understanding like, oh, this is about your kids as well has been very rewarding. Yeah, for sure. So what advice do you have for students interesting, interested in working alongside either Boise State or community health efforts, but just don't know where to start or how to get involved? I would say reach out to previous students, current students, and faculty. Um, a lot of my networking has started in the classroom, and one of my favorite things about the faculty in the College of Health Sciences and the School of Public and Population Health is how open they are and how much they want you to succeed. And they're always happy to sit down with you and chat about even how you are, how you're doing, how your classes are going, mm -hmm. and then also list out some potential opportunities that you want to secure and how they can get you connected with those opportunities. And it's it's as easy as sending an email, um, just asking for their office hours, chatting with them after class. Everyone is just super open and they really want to see you do well in this space. I agree. The faculty in our program is very passionate and they truly care. And I completely understand that it's terrifying sometimes to talk to your professor. Um, but the one thing I would say is that they truly care about what they're teaching 
And I think one of the things that helped me become engaged was talking to a professor and saying, oh, this is, I'm really interested in this that you're talking about and continuing that conversation. Great, great. Well, to wrap up our episode, there's community members out there or students that want to follow along with Community for Youth's efforts. Uh, how would they find you? Well, we have a website. It's communitiesforyouth.org, and we're also on social media. Yeah, you can find us on Facebook or Instagram. Um, you can sign up for our uh, monthly newsletters and do you want to talk about what's on the newsletters? Um, I'm not sure what's on the newsletter. I know, I don't know. <laughs> so for our newsletters, if we do communicate key... Um, actually, let me pull one up. I, no, that, I think that's okay. Um, we don't have to talk about what's on the newsletters. Um, whatever you want. But on our website, you can um, sign up for our monthly newsletters and also join an action team we typically do action team meetings once a month um, it's where you can come sit with us um, get an update on the work that we're doing the work that everyone else in this space is doing and how we can all collaborate together great yeah join our action teams make your voice be heard awesome well thank you both so much for joining us on this episode today thank you so much for having, for having us we really appreciate it Thanks for listening to Bronco Tales. Join us next week as we dive into the extracurriculars that come with being a nursing student. From joining the Student Nurses Association to building relationships with faculty as a research assistant, senior Nicolette Messbrenner shares the benefits she's experienced from taking every opportunity to get involved outside of class. We'll see you there.